Okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. I'm just going to move on to the next slide. Um, so, um, hi everyone. As you heard, I'm Nikki Crew, and I was asked to talk to you guys today a little bit about a project we've been running over the last two seasons about understanding how planting dates might impact sunflower development and sclerotinia headrock progression. So before I start, I just want to say all of the work I'm going to present today is actually um, thanks to my PhD student, Frazier Mafumo. She did all the plantings, all the collections, all the data collection for both seasons. Um, and in June, we went to the International Sunflower Conference in Serbia, and she actually won a poster award for her presentation there, which is quite um, great. So before I start, I decided I'd give you guys a little background into who I am, because I'm a little bit new in this forum. So I actually did my PhD and all my postgrad studies um, in the Forest Molecular Genetics Group at the University of Pretoria. And this is a really great experience because the Forest Molecular Genetics Group is funded strongly by Mondi and SAPI, and it was a great place to learn how you can balance research um, in an academic setting with research in a company setting. After I finished my PhD with um, Prof. Zander Mayberg, I actually got a NSF um, grant to go do a postdoctoral fellowship at um, UC Davis in California. And there we act I started working on sunflower, and I joined the Harmer Lab. And the Harmer Lab's focus is really on plant circadian clocks. So what is a circadian clock? Well, it's your internal clock. So when you travel somewhere and you get jet lag, it's because your clock is not aligned with the daylight cycles outside. That's why you feel so terrible. So um, she was interested in how plant clocks work, because all organisms, plants, fungus, we all have a clock that help us align our systems with the day-night cycles. And through this research, we were investigating how the clock regulates sunflower tracking through the day when they're juveniles, how it actually regulates head orientation and how that can affect seed development, and also how the clock can regulate actual flowering process on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so after my postdoc, I came back to the University of Pretoria to start my own research group. And I knew I wanted to continue working on sunflower, and I also knew I wanted to um, involve the industry or have a balance between the academic research and industry research, similar to what I experienced in my PhD. So I didn't know this arena very well here in South Africa, so I did a bunch of reading, went to a couple of farmers' days, and started trying to think, where can my research fit? Because I was interested in how the circadian clock works, how plants perceive their environment, and how this affects their growth and development. And there were a couple of things that came up while I was doing this exploring. There was this comment in this one paper in 2015, where uh, it's on the Grain SA website, where they spoke about um, sunflower production in the country. It's a bit older. And one of the things they highlighted there, or I found interesting, was they said, as a consequence, many producers see the crop, which is sunflower, as a catch crop, preference is not always given to timing of production or optimal planting dates. And then the other thing I came across was a comment at a farmer's day where someone said, oh, well, one of the good ways to um, control sclerotinia is with controlling flowering dates. And I started to think, well, how does um, planting dates and flowering dates interact with each other, and how can this affect sclerotinia head rot progression and how does this relate to plant development? And so we got some really nice funding from Oil and Protein, development, um, Oil and Protein Seed Development Trust to start looking into this question. So we decided to go into the basics first and just do a simple planting day trial. We used one cultivar, just a standard cultivar that's planted fairly regularly across different countries, I mean, places in South Africa. And then um, we did very detailed planting dates. From October to March, every single month we planted. And we did this in two different locations. Um, we, this is a collaborative project, and we work closely with ARC at Potchefstroom, the grain crops guys. So our first planting, um, planting site was at Potchefstroom, and it was an open field, 
regular um, agricultural practices. We did, um, every two weeks, we went and did some manual phenotyping, and we also measured yield components. While we were setting up this trial, um, we found out that Dr. Dirk Swanefelder at ARC at Biotech in Pretoria had gotten funding to establish a uh, Phenospecs um, high-throughput phenotyping platform at the ARC in Poch. And so we were also able to plant our planting dates under the system. And this does automated phenotyping where you can actually measure the plants every single day, multiple times a day. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about how this system works in a minute. So then we also replicated the trial at the University of Pretoria's experimental farms at Innovation Africa. And there, because it's closer, we were able to do weekly, um, oh, sorry, weekly <laughs> phenotyping. And we also measured some pollination factors as well, because those you need to do early in the morning at a certain time on a daily basis. So what is the Phenospex field scan? Well, what it really is is this robotic gantry that straddles the field. It carries eight sensors, two per row, and um, it moves up and down the field scanning plants. It can scan um, a whole field every two hours, that seems excessive, but it can do it. Um, you have barcodes, so the scanners pick up the barcodes and know, oh, this is planting date X or cultivar Y. Um, and what can these scanners measure? Well, these scanners can do red, green, blue, which is your normal photography, near-infrared, and LIDAR. And two scanners scan each row, which means with um, point cloud um, analysis, you can actually build 3D models of every plant in your row for top views or side views. And from this data, you can actually estimate biomass, plant height, leaf angle, leaf area index, many indices like NDVI, and you can get a read on plant health with a measure of greenness. Um, so we did this, our first full trial was this season. Um, we had a couple of pilot trials just to get the system working right before. And um, we've got all the data, but we were scanning four times a day for the whole season, so we have about 50,000 scans that we need to get through now. <laughs> um, so that's on the list for this round. Um, I guess watch the space. We'll be back. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, we also had our conventional planting dates, trials at Potch of Sturm and Pretoria, just a general random plot design with three replicates per planting date, and we also had an irrigated Control. And Fraser did a huge number of different um, phenotyping or collecting data on different traits. Um, we couldn't, like I said, do all the continuous traits at Potchefstroom because it's a bit of a drive for us every day. Um, so, but there's enough overlapping data between the two sites. Um, yeah, and we just wanted to measure everything, get an overview of what happens to the plants at these different planting dates. So this is, there's a lot of data, so I'm only going to show you a few um, bits of data today, otherwise we could be here for a while. And um, the first thing we looked at was growth dynamic data. So the first one was num leaf number, so how, of how many leaves emerge each week. And this gives you an idea of how the plant is growing. And so in Pretoria, both season one and season two look very similar all the planting dates except for the very, very late March planting date in pink, um, and filled their leaves at the same rate, except for the first season where there was this January outlier, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, at Potchefstroom, we didn't get all the continuous measurements we'd like in the first season due to logistics and COVID, but the second season went much better, and again, most of them grew pretty much the same except in Potch, it was this early planting date that was the extreme outlier. So when we looked at plant height, it was pretty much the same story at both sites, where in Pretoria, February, was, uh, March was just too late, and October was too early in Potch of Strim. So the growth data looks like you can plant, you have some wiggle room. Um, we also, so from my postdoc research, I'm very interested in flowering and how flowering interacts with the environment. And so 
We've also been taking floral traits. So we counted pollinator visits across the different planting dates. And they weren't too different across the season, which is a good thing. What we did find in our first season was that that January stunted growth we saw had an elevated stigma receptivity. So what is stigma receptivity? This is really the flower's preparedness to accept pollen and be pollinated. And so we thought this was quite an interesting finding, and I'll talk a little bit more about why we think that is. If we um, just go to the general final biomass, parameters and seed count numbers. For Optoria, that's pretty much what we expected. November to February was fairly good with the growth parameters and the seed, and seed number, full seeds, except that February had quite a lot of unfilled seeds. We also um, saw that in seed weight, um, the January, February and March planting date underperformed. Um, we're still looking at this season's data to confirm if that's the same thing. And Potch had fairly similar um, traits as well with the late planting dates underperforming when we look at seed traits. So from that, I guess we can say overall um, good growth yields uh, and yields are observed consistently for both sites in November, December and January plantings. And while the growth parameters look good in some of the others, when you get to the seed yield, it's not so great. It's expected because for the late planting dates, you just don't have enough heat units to carry you through. And the early planting dates, October, there's probably not enough water available at the time. So let's talk a little bit about this January planting date that we saw this low um, accumulation of... Um, or stunted growth in January in Pretoria. So, and then we also, remember, saw this elevated stigma receptivity. And when we looked at seed fill, filling, we actually saw that the January planting date did, had pretty good or well-filled seeds, which helps to enforce that those plants were actually being pollinated at a slightly higher rate, or at the same rate, even though they appeared to be smaller overall. So when we dug into the weather data, so both our sites have full weather um, stations, we actually saw Pretoria had a pretty severe heat wave around middle of February. Our plant, January planting date was four weeks old when that heat wave hit. The seedlings got pretty badly scorched. They were kind of brown leaves. So they weren't, and so we're pretty sure that's why they didn't grow very well. But interesting, with this elevated stigma receptivity, it suggests that the plants were able to adapt to the stress that they had early in their lives and put more energy into flowering at the end of the day. And so that's why we actually didn't have too many unfilled seeds in that planting date, even though the plants were stunted. And so we think that there is this... Um, adaptation that can happen in a plant even when it's heat stressed um, but we did see January plants had lower seed weight overall so we don't know if that's because it was a slightly later planting date and so it's exacerbated by the heat stress and if we saw heat, a heat stress event let's say earlier in November or December they might still have maintained their seed weight and that's something we need to explore a little bit further. Um, and as a plant biologist, this is really <laughs> exciting for me. Um, but the part you guys are probably here for is, since we had these planting dates in the field, we decided to also catalog, just to have a look, what, what diseases do we see in which planting dates over these two seasons? It was just a, a scanning by eye, looking for symptoms. We didn't do any molecular identification at this level. We saw mostly the usual suspects on sunflower, the alternaria, foma, sclerotinia stem, and head rot. But when we documented this over both seasons, um, we really saw that, it, depending on the pathogen, some of them did seem to have some association with season or time of um, planting. So powdery mildew was only in Pretoria and in the earlier parts of the year. 
Um, and black foma was also seemed to be associated with more of the earlier planting dates at both locations. But um, and Altenaria seem to move around, probably in look, association with weather and humidity. And what was interesting to me was, to us, was the um, sclerotinia, because in the first season we saw a lot more root or stem rot, whereas in the second season we saw most of it being head rot. And the second season, as most of us know, was quite a lot wetter. Um, these incidences weren't high, which was just if we saw one, we would mark it, but it was there, and there's a clear trend. So we decided to do a sclerotinia inoculation trial at the UP site. We didn't want to be one of those people who brings our pathogen with us and puts it in the field, so we waited in the first season to identify sclerotinia in the, in the field. We isolated those cultures and then took those cultures back into the field for the second season at our experimental farm. We uh, inoculated plant, older plants, about um, older flowering plants. We cut the little windows, stuck some mycelia in there, sprayed it so it was nice and moist, closed it up, and then we bagged the plants. We either gave them pollination bags, just as a, actually to prevent the birds eating our plants while we did the trial. Um, the brown paper bags were our positive control because we wanted them to increase the humidity as much as possible to make sure the infection established. Um, and then we also had a negative control, which was just the agar. And then we scored the plants every three days for a month. When I say we, I mean Frasier. Um, <laughs> so the score is if it's um, less than 12% of the head, it's a 1. If it's 90% of the head, it's a 5, and so on. So our positive controls worked pretty well. We had pretty high disease progression. And when we looked at our planting dates, it kind of broke into three different sets. So the highest um, disease progression happened in the December, January, and February planting dates in Pretoria. And then the early and late planting dates seemed to have an intermediate disease progression. And for some reason, November was an extreme outlier with very low disease incidence. And the severity scores are just another way of showing the same data. So we started to think, well, what was special about November when we did this inoculation trial? So the first thing we thought was, well, let's look at temperature and humidity during that time. And so we just looked at the averages. And really, between October, November, December, you can't really see a very big difference here in either of these sets. There's a very marginal increase in temperature overall for November, but not a lot. So we were a little bit at loss. So Fraser did a um, statistical analysis using a linear regression model to try and identify which factors were influencing this disease pattern. And it popped out that very significant, with a high correlation, um, the Tmax and Tmin in the November planting date were suppressing disease um, progression in this planting date. But we didn't see that in the averages. So I actually went in and looked specifically at the days when we did the inoculation from day one all the way across at the Tmax and Tmin for October, November. And you can see from day one when we inoculate and for about a week, the temperatures were quite a bit cooler in October than they were in November. So it's possible that it's that heat, um, slightly higher temperatures that helped suppress the disease progression in um, November. So we still need to confirm these, this data. It's kind of hot off the presses at the moment. Um, but what we can say is there doesn't appear to be a clear planting date that would help you escape sclerotinia every year. And it's probably due to this really close association for a small window with the environment. So you have to have the right temperature and the right immunity have at the exact same time when your flower is ready and there's enough spore load in the field. And then from this data, it looks like you need to maintain those environmental conditions for at least four or five days for an, a, a um, infection to establish. And so that means that may, actually predicting when or where it's going to strike is really, really tough. 
So overall from my talk, I guess, conclusion is we had um, some conclusions on growth dates and, gro I mean, planting dates and optimal planting dates and what happens under um, later or earlier planting dates. We also um, found that heat stress seedlings seem to be able to recover and adapt. And we think that there's not really a clear link between planting date and escaping sclerotinia head rot. So what are our next steps on this project? Well, we're hoping to get money together to send Frazier to INRA in France to go and work with um, Dr. De Beck and Dr. Langlade. They're sunflower specialists who developed the sunflow model. And we're hoping we can um, model planting date yield and sclerotinia interactions um, with their model. They have added a disease component using verticillium wilt that looked promising before. Then um, we also want to further look into understanding this um, heat stress and how it might enhance um, floral traits later in the plant's life. Um, we have a lot of um, analysis to do on the phenospex data, and we also need to complete all our yield traits analysis. So we're also planning on doing um, some quality assays to look at protein and oil content on all of our seeds for the season, um, and also finish up all the data analysis from this season. And so that's pretty much the end of my talk. There's always a village to thank when you present these projects. So um, first of all, thank you to the Oil and Protein Seed Development Trust because without our funders, we don't, can't actually do this research. Um, I need to say thank you to the University of Pretoria and ARC field teams for all the work that they do. Our collaborators at um, the ARC, Dr. Swanefelder and Dr. Mali, um, our collaborators in the geography department, as well as all the institutes and labs that we interact with on a, every, on a daily basis. Lastly, I just need to say a big thank you to this awesome group of postgraduate students that I get to work with every single day. And thank you for your time.